You are listening to KGNU Boulder, Denver, and Fort Collins. We are going to continue our conversation about creating a sustain a su- sustainable uh, local uh, food shed with a panel of guests today. Before I introduce them, though, I want to offer our sincere condolences to the Skoken family of Black Cat Farm, who lost their son, Kelsey, in a tragic accident last Friday. They are such an integrit- in, inter, in, integral part of the local agriculture and food community, and we are holding them in our hearts at this time. It's such sad, such sad um, story and news. Mm-hmm. Something that it really touches my heart. Um, and I was, you know, really, I think it's important for us to stop and think about this and hold them, hold them. Him close this dear family. Um, well, I want to introduce now the panel discussion. You know, the guest in my panel discussion today, and I have, I am super lucky because Brian Copen, uh, director of the farmers market, is joining us today. Hello, Brian. Morning. How are you today? Thank you. Good morning for for joining us for this panel discussion. It's important your presence here. I'm super happy. Um, we also have Kenna and Mark Gatridge. They are the owners of All In Farms. And I'm super happy that you guys are here. And thank you so much for allowing me to shadow you in your farm. I had such a good time. Um, I ran around with the chickens with my son. And it was a really amazing experience. Um, I have Isabel Sanchez. I call her the guru of permaculture. Uh, she lives in a mobile home in Mapleton, and recently uh, she stopped working in the Denver Growing Gardens, and she has a lot to say, like a wonderful Cuban lady that she is. Um, <laughs> welcome, welcome, Isabel, to the show. Thank you. <laughs> and I also want to introduce Nick and Marisa Di Domenico. Nick Di Domenico and Marisa, they are young farmers from Elk Run Farms. I also wanted so bad to go and visit their farm, but I was not able. But I'm thinking that it is important to bring them along because they are young farmers. And mm, you can connect with Mark, and I'm pretty sure that you also know each other. So, (laughs) but anyway, I thought this is a powerhouse, and I am super happy to have you here. And I would like, um, you know, to, to hear from Brian first. Brian, um, we heard in our report from the local farms, as well as backyard farmers and urban farmers, all involved in growing local food. Is there a connection between them all? Are they all part of the local food ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. The you know the idea of what's local is is a pretty broad one we tend to define it by what's in the immediate area how close is it in terms of how can we how far is the drive for instance Uh, but actually uh, it's more than that right it's also the food system that we have a connection to the food system that we have some kind of Uh, emotional bond with the growers and uh, the producers and that can mean that it's very close or also not close so even if I'm in Boulder something in Denver is part of my local food system it's part of my local food shed and they're all critical components of just reattaching us to where our food comes from Uh, You know, many of us aren't fortunate enough to live right down the street from a farm, but thanks to urban gardens and urban farms, we can be fortunate enough to live down the street from a grow house. Uh, So they're all critical elements without question. Yeah. Um, We also heard about the food um, uh, shortages in the grocery stores at the start of the coronavirus pandemic. And at the same time, restaurants and schools were shut down and farmers couldn't uh, supply them. Uh, Talk about the food supply system and why 
isn't a challenge to switch things around at short notice with the current centralized system? Well, that's a, a relatively large question, but I'll try to give it a, a, a quick answer. Um, you know, the let's start with what we know the best, our centralized large industrial food system that provides us strawberries in the winter and broccoli year round. And we are for want of nothing except maybe flavor and nutrition. But outside of that, we're for want of nothing. Well, we have really become quite dependent on this system in many ways. And what COVID-19 did was show us that when the system is broken, just mm -hmm. how valuable we really are. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a dramatic experience because all of the sudden, almost everybody experienced the feeling of food insecurity. And it wasn't that we all didn't have the means or that most of us didn't have the means to purchase food. It was that there wasn't food to purchase. As Michael Moss indicated earlier, the grocery store shelves were bare. And at the same time, we have this robust local food system that's growing right here in our community. And yet so many people were unaware that it was here. And at the same time, that robust local food system had a plethora of issues in front of it. The restaurant accounts went away, the farmer's market opening was delayed, the, the traditional distribution channels for those farmers were in question. And what's beautiful about that local food system, not just in the fact that it is right in front of us, but it is incredibly nimble because small systems, small organizations can adapt quickly. They don't need a Form 320 submitted to purchasing in order to decide if there should be a meeting about how we do something. They just do it. And the farmers here on the panel are evidence of that, of being excellent entrepreneurs and pivoting quickly and, and really adapting to the circumstances. And because of those adaptations, we had access to food. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. That's Brian Copen. He is the director of the Farmers Market. And we are having a panel discussion here with wonderful people after the airing of the series Farming for the Trends podcast. And I would like also at this point to extend the invitation to mm -hmm. Kenna and Mark to talk about their experience because something that it's true like Brian is saying, and Michael Moss explained to us from Kilt Farm that yes, the CSAs exploded, that farmers that didn't even had their CSAs in place suddenly had to put it together because the demand was growing. So Kenna and Mark, take it. Um, thank you, and I agree with, with what Brian said, and I think this COVID-19 gave us a, a chance to really re-examine a lot of things in our lives from relationships to work to everything. Everybody's going through a lot of changes this year. And I think um, farming can be one of those highlights and it really just ties back to nature. I'm, I'm it's great that we have permaculture people on, on the panel today because mm -hmm. all this ties back to when you're a diversified, a very diversified system, you can adjust quicker. The reason these farmers that were only selling romaine to the school district couldn't diverse when we're having huge problems is because that was the only thing they were doing. And that's our entire industrial food system is built around finding that silver bullet, the magic seed, the magic fertilizer. There is no magic bullets. And this COVID-19 is a great example. There's no vaccine. The vaccine is we all need to come together and eat healthier and take care of each other and boost our immune systems. It's a very complex system. There's no magic bullet that's gonna solve COVID-19. There's no magic bullet that's going to solve the, the food system. So I think it's a great example of what happens on small scales where people like Nick and Marissa were busy. I know they've been planting a lot more trees and diversifying at their farm and providing more education out there. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same thing at Olin Farms and 
and but it, we're, it's only possible because we were so diversified. We didn't have all our eggs in one basket, as you could say. And so it really ties back to the permaculture concepts of why uh, local food can't, the only path forward is through this diversification, even with the farmers markets having a little bit left, less traffic as we de decentralize crowds, we had to diversify and do satellite pickups at the farm, at restaurants, to all around. There's all kinds of satellite distributions going on. And that's because we were quick enough to, to set up systems and reach out to our partners in the community and figure out ways to make, make this work going forward. But it's only because we were small and able and agile that anything worked at all. Yes, and you know, also, we are really focused today on farmers involved in regenerative, that's such a difficult word to say for me, regenerative practices, but that is not the full picture. There are many other farmers user using pesticides and growing GMOs here in Boulder County. How do they fit into this discussion on local food, on local food security today? And what comes to my mind right now when I'm asking that question is me walking with Kenna through uh, her farm and she explaining to me how, you know, the reconstruction of the soil and everything was done by community, by people coming together and helping move the trees, you know, really. Um, and then also the other thing that she shared with me that is allowing everything to grow, all the green things to just grow wild in a way, you know, without having to cut them around. So if you can, you know, um, I don't know, talk about it because mm -hmm. it is important to, there's like a lot of different ways of um, planting food, but at the end of the day, they are the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the the issue with around pesticide use and GMOs on open space in particular that we've been trying to phase out of Boulder County for more than a decade is it just gets comes down to economics. There's not a lot of economic alternatives for these large scale parcels. That's one of the things we're doing through our Project 95 is taking on some bigger leases and trying to prove some new systems. But it, as you say, it's only involved with community support. And we're like, we can't, that, there's no economic model for the farmer to do all that work by themselves and all that investment by themselves uh, to, to build these new systems. So it is a community-based model that that's the way through. And it's not that people are choosing to farm away because it's non-regenerative. They're just trying to find a way to make a living. There's no, no farmer I know, like <laughs> driving new cars and making great livings. Like it's, it's all, a struggle no matter what size you are number which way you grow and the regenerative way is the most labor intensive and here in boulder county in the united states labor drives everything we have very strict minimum wage laws we have very and it's good we need that, that working class and that's what regenerative agriculture offers is we can get people back to work back in the ground that's what our high school internship is really about is it's like getting kids their first job i know nick and marissa have a lot of community involved at their farm too and that's that's why how, how to make it work It's this coming together. Also, something that I was able to see is, you know, the young um, harbor, you know, the young farmers, these young kids, young ones in the grass, in, you know, moving around the grasshoppers, cutting the lettuces. It was such a beautiful experience. So I don't want Kenna to just not say any anything. I, I'm trying to get Kenna to share with, with us, you know, this wonderful experience that, that you provide at the farm. Um, well, I think we're all connected to the land. Needs to start from the little ones so they can grow as a different people, different persons as a part of the world. The world. So we need to start early to, to give that passion and seeds and love to the land. And also people need to know where their food comes from. So what a perfect age when they're little. Uh, I have been in some talks that when I ask like, what is your favorite fruit? And they say ketchup, you know? So things <laughs> like that needs to change and, and it's real, but we need to connect the youth and the kids to the land. And we do it through the summer classes, and some talks around the area. It is very important for me to do that. Mm. Mm. That's Kenna Gottrich from um, 
All Ins Farm. And, you know, we are talking today about farming in Boulder County, growing food. And I would like, um, and we are talking with farmers, we are talking with locals, and I would like to have um, Isabel Sanchez, the guru of permaculture, talk to us about her small garden, but extremely productive garden in her house. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, my, thank you. Uh, my space is probably 34 by 87. I have fruit trees. I have greens. I have annuals, perennials, herbs. Um, I just, like I shared recently, stopped having chickens and rabbits um, because I'm going to do a little traveling. But the need is so great. One of the things that when I come back from my travels and want to start working in Boulder is having this accessibility to Latino families because in the agriculture or the local agriculture, you know, the cost of food is so expensive to grow organic. The labor intensity, um, the prices that we have to charge. So it really puts a wall for the Latino community uh, to have that kind of access. And, and that's something that I want to start working with in, in, in the neighborhood. I've been here 10 years, and in the 10 years that I've been in this community when I first came, I wanted chickens. I never had raised kids without chickens. And I got here and I went to the farmer's market and it was like parales, a dozen eggs. And I was like, I need to get chickens. So I had to get on a program here because nobody had chickens in mobile home parks. And I had to do a whole kind of meetings. And, and, and finally, three years later, now it's Pierce. And we have about six people, grow, you know, raising chickens here. We have probably about 35 gardens at the Maple, Mapleton Mobile Home. Um, sometimes I do classes here. The whole front yard is full of herbs and people could just pass and harvest. And I always give them recipes, how to do tinctures and how to make teas if they're sick. Because I think that comes with that is that for the Latino families that are struggling for access to healthy food, they're also struggling with medical uh, they don't have access to uh, good health care, whether alternative or regular Eastern um, health care. So if we could teach families to do mullein and, ear and garlic eardrops, and now with this corona, what tea should we be taking to boost our immune? Um, and we could go right outside to our home and, 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 and get them and show our kids. I think this is a necessity in Boulder County. Mm -hmm. I spent seven years in Denver commuting, working in a beautiful nonprofit, the Grow House. And I saw the amount of growth a community could do if they work together. So listening to the other farmers that are doing classes with little ones, that's, that's right to my heart because if we get the kids young enough um, and we educate them, I, I laugh one time when even at, at our farm, our indoor farming at the grow house, we were doing a summer program and we asked the kids and there were chickens there and we had a little market and they went in and they saw the eggs and we were outside and we were like, well, where do eggs come from? And they were like, inside the store. <laughs> and we were like, okay, we're doing something wrong. <laughs> so we had to show them that the eggs come from a chicken and, and how do we cook them and, and why? And, you know, so, Children are sponges. If we could get them passionate to learning about agriculture and, and eating healthy and, and where the food comes from, I think there'll be a shift. And, and this virus is showing us that it's a very delicate line to be able to access food. Like, like Brian was saying, even with resources, even with money. But that's the, the few that could do that. Now for struggling families, they can't get them at the store, but then they don't even have the funds to buy it. I think we, you know, I, my philosophy is that once we know how to do something, we have to share it and we have to encourage families to get a little self-sufficient and, and grow and start slow and steady like one of our permaculture principles. We don't have to go out and get a hundred acres, but we could start really small in a small plot in an urban land. And, you and know. That's precisely, that's precisely, Isabel, what 
Marisa and Nick are doing. They are starting, you know, small but wonderful. And I also, you know, connecting you is kind of super wonderful for me right now because of permaculture and because I know that Nick went down to South America and that's what he learned the permaculture. And, you know, you, Marisa, you, Isabel, from, from Cuba, um, also, you know, you really touch us also because I'm Latin. I'm like, yes, this is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I would like Marisa and Nick to have the opportunity as young farmers to talk about, you know, how is it, how difficult and how wonderful it is to establish yourselves as farmers in Boulder County. Awesome. Thanks a lot. We're uh, really glad to be on the show with you all today, the panel, and um, we've been working here on this land. We call it Elk Run for about five years now, and um, we were really the first people to do any kind of agricultural endeavors on the land, at least for the last 15 or so years. And I was just in South America, you know, five years before we had gotten here and had seen a lot of off-grid communities and how different indigenous people were living down there and just living in harmony with the land and felt really inspired to come back home. This is where I grew up around Boulder County and just really get, get into some of these permaculture and regenerative practices that I had been learning about and just practice and really see what would, we could create. And we are really limited on water at our farm here. Uh, We have a pretty strong well, and that's the only irrigation that we have. So just from those difficulties of not having really enough water to keep moist the entire parcel, it's a 14-acre parcel here, just began experimenting with different earth-moving practices, uh, design practices, and just seeing what was possible with these like passive water catchment practices and you know, we're in a pretty dry area. It's almost, you know, semi-arid desert climate, especially where we are kind of in the shadow of uh, Long's Peak. And just watching how these practices, especially design, can really just fuel uh, these ecological systems being rebuilt, you know, even with minimal water, um, these thoughtful design practices have begun to really shaped this place into a flourishing ecosystem filled with food crops, medicine crops, um, livestock, and just seeing how these integrated systems can really bring life to the land. Um, And just proving how much can be done with very little, very little water um, and very little resources too, just kind of on a shoestring budget, pulling everything together. So just like what Mark and Hannah are saying, like really relying on community support, offering opportunities for people to learn, people to practice uh, different techniques, learn about gardening, learn about animal husbandry, and just learn about the other um, regenerative techniques that we're using and just watching the community gather around. And it was really beautiful during COVID time. The first sort of lockdown, we had this surge of volunteers, people just wanting to come out and be together, eat food together, even you know, it's a little bit socially distanced and just be outside and work with the land. And that's been really beautiful to see people wanting to reconnect to each other and where their food comes from. And we've been really happy to, to watch that take place as our farm grows into a flourishing little food forest uh, here in the desert. So, Yeah. Nick uh, Di Domenico with uh, Elk Run Farm, um, talking about, you know, the importance of knowing where your food comes from and the difficulties that, you know, sometimes the land here uh, presents. Why? Because the soil is depleted. Why? Because it's dry. It is not easy. I I see that you work really hard. When I interview Michael Moss, um, I realized that, you know, he said, we work 10 hours. You know, it's really extensive, the amount of time that you need to work to get the land to produce. Marisa, you want to say something? Since I I see you there, I would like to also hear from you. Mm, Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I feel so honored to be with you all and feel inspired in this moment. And I think what I'll speak to is just the change in mindset. And as a young woman, as young farmers, you know, most of our peers who are in their early 30s or late 20s, you know, we're used to going out to bars and cheersing and maybe staying up really late. And it's like a whole new lifestyle. You know, we have to be up at 6 a.m. We're, you know, we just harvested this morning for our CSA and now we're sitting down and it's like, 
beautiful to be able to just speak and connect. But really what I value about this work and farming in general is that we're developing a deeper connection to the earth. And that to me is what's going to change ideologies, change what people value. And as humans, I think we're really seeking that connection. And maybe it's hard to identify that, but that rhythm that you innately become a part of when you're farming can heal us. I really believe that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's been an incredible journey to, to surrender to that and to learn and to have the earth and the animals and the plants reflect to me what I need to see, what I need to work with. And, you know, just feeling really inspired by this conversation around young children. And also, you know, our interns here are in college. So they're coming here where all their friends are going nuts. And they're like, wow, I'm finally finding myself. So that ability to have structure, relationship to the moon, to the sun, it's, it's encouraging. So, so beautiful what you have said, that those connections. And, uh, you know, that's what really it happened through this episode i connected with uh, farmers i connected with people in the farmers market i connected with people you know harvesting in their homes and it really opened my eyes to a new boulder county and hopefully you know these practices continue and people will continue uh, really purchasing and supporting the local foods. I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining uh, me today in this panel discussion. The conversation can continue forever, but I really want to thank Brian uh, Copon from uh, the Farmer's Market, Mark and Kenna with All Ins Farms. I also want to thank Marisa and Nick with Elk Run and Isabel Sanchez, of course, uh, the guru of permaculture. I will connect you all and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank it you. is fantastic, thank you. really. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.